Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Donnelly. And I'm Dr. Hinson. And we are the Good Doctors of Abbey Research, here with your recap of an analysis of season one, episode seven of The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, we, for those of you who have never gotten a chance to join us before, welcome. Hello. We are Doctors of Social Science um, with a focus on history, anthropology, that one, and sociology, this one. And uh, we, <clears throat> Aaron focuses a lot on imprisonment narratives and how people function within both physical and emotional imprisonment. And I function a lot on religion and women and silencing. So as we kind of combine all those things, The Handmaid's Tale is pretty much tailor-made for us. So we're on episode seven. This one is a different one. Um, it's an entirely, almost entirely flashback episode um, about Luke. It picks up with Luke where uh, we left him in the woods, essentially. So he is shot at by Gileadian guards, but he escapes when an ambulance crashes. He takes some medical supplies um, and he ends up with a resistance group going to Canada. Um, the survivors that are heading in this resistance group are a nun, uh, an, a mute escaped handmaid or seemingly mute one, um, a homosexual gentleman and a uh, daughter of a U.S. Army soldier who had become an automatic guardian because that's what we know happened to all the Army folks. The army um, folks. So he wasn't going to go because uh, Luke's a bit of a stubborn jerk. Oh, just a little bit. We're honest, yeah. So he wasn't going to go. And then um, one of the survivors takes him to a church where the, the, uh, the Gileadian authorities hung townspeople from the rafters of the church as a um, punishment for resisting. And I think the church in particular was very symbolic in that to remind them that their faith would no longer protect them. Mm -hmm. So at that point, Luke's like, you know what? Leaving sounds like a great plan. Means the next boat. So, I mean, we're, so at that point then we flash back to like when he and June and Hannah were together. Um, there's a lot, like we start to see the process of like, they were trying to escape to Canada. There was a lot of paperwork. This is all like y'all pretty boring. Um, television, it fills in some gaps that we didn't know. I can't say that I was very compelled um, but at the end of it, we do know that Luke and the quasi-mute handmaid named Erin are now safely in Little America in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and while in the administrative office, Luke gets the letter from June that she sent through the ambassador that said, I love you so much, save Hannah. Yeah. Amazing. So that's where we're at. So... Yeah. Even though, like, you tend to like flashback episodes of things in general more than I do, because as much as I love context, you, like, have a relationship with it. So, how did you feel about this? Yeah, I mean, up until this point, there hadn't really been much, as much of a backstory uh, as I would have normally liked um, as the historian part of me, uh, which has always been kind of my first love. I came to anthropology. Uh, after uh, my love of history. Uh, that's always been where I've kind of sat with things and I love context. Um, and it felt like, and I think intentionally so, that we were thrown into this world uh, of Gilead and supposed to be as lost and confused uh, as Offred uh, Stroke June and the, and the other um, people that are involved in what Gilead is now. Um, and I appreciate that as a storytelling mechanism, um, but I don't like to sit in, um, the unknown as much. So I was really glad to have a flashback episode. Uh, even though it wasn't the most exciting flashback episode, it was still uh, interesting for me too. Uh, and the most interesting were the flashbacks between discussions uh, with June and Moira as the new regime starts to take place in Gilead, America. We're not sure where we are. Um, we've spent so much time focusing on the current plight of women, uh, even more specifically Handmaid's um, in this new world, but uh, this emotionally charged perspective of offer that we're given is limited. So as we delve further into levels of, of complicitness, it was intriguing to me to see how Lucas was portrayed um, as, as kind, of a, kind of a jerk, uh, how he reacted to the increasing restrictions placed on women uh, in society, particularly on his wife, 
Uh, and eventually he realizes that he can't raise his daughter nor expect his wife to live in this world. And that's when they begin to plan their convoluted escape. But it was a process for him. So he was asleep for a while too, to use that some, same um, metaphor that, that June used in her narration earlier on. Uh, and I think for me, there wasn't, as much content in this episode for our focus, for the stuff that we're interesting, but I found uh, the visuals really powerful nonetheless. Uh, what struck you most about those opening scenes, those flashbacks to um, pre-Gilead? Did you notice anything different? Because this is the first time we've really had a male perspective in the in the show. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, my patience for scenes in which people stare at people is limited, and that <laughs> is almost this entire episode. Um, yeah, I call it middle distance television where people are staring off into the middle distance. It's why I noped out a madman. Yeah, I just, yeah. like, I really like words. Um, <laughs> and like, yeah, it's why I read books. Like, yeah. So, yeah. but what I noticed the most about those opening scenes were that everything was centered around his responsibility to his wife and his daughter. And so we had long moments of him just looking at them. And like, so much of me, I wanted to be a filmmaker. was like, I get it. He's protective of them. Like, I get it. Um, like, we're shown pretty quickly that Lucas is willing to die for both June and Hannah, um, but that he makes the ultimately harder decision of living hope, living in hope of finding them again. So yeah. I get that. I would have liked a little bit less of like how they got to Canada and a little bit more of what life in little America looks like. Yeah. So I think like the balance was, the pacing was off for me in this episode. I was thankful for some of the context and the explanations, but like it was this tease, like because it didn't answer all the questions or even five of my questions. I was frustrated that it covered story we kind of already knew. Yeah. Like I didn't need any of that in the cabin. I'll just be real honest. Like you could have covered that in a conversation. Like there's, there was an expeditious storytelling here and it kind of got to me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know more about the bodies in the church. Yeah. Like the Gilead version of Christianity is so warped. It is so, so warped. And I am 1 million percent positive that there are pastors and lay people who would have fought in the war. And I want to know about them. I want to know about the revolution. I want to know how long it took. I want to know about the physical boundaries of Gilead. I want to know, is Toronto still in the same place? Is Canadian border still in the same place? We're thinking Mexico. Am I still talking about the Rio Grande? Like, that's what I want to know. Yeah. But then we got to the end. And that hallway of missing people in little America and that moment in the embassy where he reads June's note, I was really grateful we were getting Lucas's perspective. Um, I was grateful that for this piece of the gender stereotype that male protecting and providing for females is so baked into Lucas and is getting activated in a appropriate to their relationship kind of way. Yeah. Um, providing and protecting for him means having Jude and Hannah's back at all times, even in the loss of hope, even in Gilead, even in Canada, he will always believe in them, always love them and always cherish them. And I think we needed a reminder that all men are not the commander, mm. nor are all men, Nick, like yeah. the, the men in the in-between spaces. Yeah. There's still Lucas is present in this world and the world is, is sorely in need of them. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, like, I've ranted about the storytelling, but this is a set piece episode. Um, they're moving to checkmate. We got three episodes left after this. So we need the outside world to invade June's Gilead. And like, I'm ready. This thing could have been 15 minutes and I would have been fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree 100%, even though I love context more than you. Um, what was really powerful uh, was to see the world expanded even to the number of people that were affected by this. So that hallway uh, in, the, in the office in Little America with all of the missing person's notes and pictures um, and just kind of gave you a sense of the gravity of what, has, of what took place and this sense of loss and, and communal grieving um, that surely has to be going on with these people who were lucky enough, I guess, to make it to Canada and still have their autonomy and their freedom, but live in perpetual fear of what has happened to the people that they loved and that they lost and not having any idea where they are being able to communicate with them. So it was extraordinarily emotionally potent right at the end there, which was, I think, obviously their intention. Uh, we all needed that reminder that life goes on outside of Gilead um, and that 
the primary aim of a lot of people and especially men is to protect women not to control them uh so we i was grateful for that even if it took 35 minutes longer than i needed um but we've got set up now for the for the cracking final three episodes so from here we will end on episode seven and pick back up with you in episode eight i'm dr hinson i'm dr donnelly and we're the good doctors of abby research and we'll see you next episode bye